guys. So when you mention the word jazz to the average person, they probably think of swing music, and for good reason. Swing was hugely popular. It was, after all, the pop music of the 1930s. It was mostly performed by big bands, which were large orchestras divided into trumpets, saxophones, trombones, and a rhythm section, which consisted of the drums, bass, guitar, and piano. And they played dance music. Above all else, swing music is dance music, which means that it was simple, it had clear melodies, and had a strong beat. This also meant that it was incredibly commercial. You could hear it in movies, on the radio, on jukeboxes, everywhere. Now, swing is sandwiched between two huge historical events. The Great Depression, which started with the stock market crash in 1929, and World War II, which ended in 1945. So the swing era was during the Depression, and it acted as a kind of counterstatement or rebellion against the unemployment and misery that the Depression caused. It served to distract people from the daily grind of reality. Now, the way I like to discuss a particular subgenre of jazz is by looking at what came before and after it. So swing grew out of New Orleans jazz and evolved into bebop. So New Orleans jazz was generally played in relatively small groups, consisting of a trumpet, trombone, clarinet, banjo, and tuba. It was polyphonic, which meant that essentially it used collective improvisation. The frontline horns, that is, the trumpet, trombone, and clarinet, all soloed at the same time. And improvisation at that time was essentially just taking the melody and embellishing it. It used pretty simple harmony and had a two-beat feel, which means it was either in 2-4 time or in 4-4 time accenting beats 1 and 3, or a flat 4 feel, which means that all four beats were roughly equal. And New Orleans jazz sounds slightly chaotic because it has all those instruments improvising at the same time with that polyphonic texture. So it sounds like there's a lot going on all at the same time and can sound a little bit, as I said, chaotic. So swing music really grew out of New Orleans. But it started adding more and more musicians until it created a big band, which often contained between about 12 and 16 musicians. Now the double bass replaced the tuba and the guitar replaced the banjo and it evolved to being a homophonic texture, which essentially means there's a single soloist improvising and then a harmony or a chord progression behind him or her. Now, swing solos or improvisation was relatively safe and relatively simple, but always created melodic and memorable melodies. Swing music was also largely arranged or composed. And with swing music, we move away from that embellished melody improvisation towards more harmonic improvisation, where you improvise with the chord progression in mind rather than with a particular melody in mind. It used a relatively simple harmony, and we find the beginnings of a backbeat rhythm, that is, a rhythm that accents beats two and four of every bar, which became more or less a jazz staple from then on. Swing had a driving beat and a strong rhythm section. It was, after all, dance music, so you could really feel the beat. Swing then later evolved into bebop, which again returned to small groups, generally consisting of a saxophone, trumpet, piano, double bass, and drums. And bebop retained that homophonic texture, so the solo or the melody over a chord progression, rather than the collective polyphonic improvisation in New Orleans. Bebop solos became very daring and very complex, and there was a greater focus on improvisation, on solo improvisation, and on virtuosity. Bebop musicians wanted to play faster and more harmonically complex than their swing counterparts. And they also used harmonic or vertical soloing, where they soloed with the chord progression in mind and completely discarded the existing melody of the song. Bebop also used much more complex harmony, retained a little bit of that um, backbeat rhythm, though it was played quite fast, um, and the rhythm section was actually quite interactive. 
That is, it responded and almost had a kind of conversation with the soloist. So in a sense, bebop was a logical outgrowth of swing. It just took everything that swing was doing, so, you know, having a homophonic texture, having individual soloists stand up and play a single solo, rather than the collective improvisation of New Orleans, and essentially just made everything more complex, pushing it to the kind of logical extreme, with complex harmonies and complex solos, complex and angular rhythmic phrases, and really fast tempos, and things like that. But this lesson is about swing. So let's dive into these ideas a little bit deeper. So some of the characteristics of swing music are, as I said before, swing music is played by big bands. And because of this, swing music had a greater emphasis on written out composition and arrangements. You can't really have 14 instruments improvising all at the same time, unless you're playing free jazz, of course. But generally, that would sound a little bit chaotic. Even more so than New Orleans jazz, which only had, say, five or six instruments. And so because he had to deal with, say, 16 instruments, the band leader had to use much more composition and arrangements to actually give each of those instruments something to play that would all sort of mesh together nicely and create some structure or some harmonic background um, for the soloist to then improvise over. And so band leaders used a whole bunch of interesting arranging techniques like um, tooties and solas and shout choruses and riffs, lots and lots of riffs. So riffs are just short melodic and rhythmic phrases or patterns that are often repeated over and over again. And swing music used a lot of really bluesy riffs and a lot of call and response riffs, often between the horn section and the rhythm section. And of course, band leaders wrote in time for people to play solos, where a single person would stand up and start improvising, usually behind a relatively simple harmonic background or chord progression. Swing is very smooth, very easy listening, and very simple. Harmonically, it used really simple chords and had a clear homophonic texture. So you're not going to find any Phrygian chords or complex polychords or stuff like that in swing music. In fact, swing musicians often preferred the major 6 chord to the major 7 chord because the major 7 chord is a bit more or a bit too dissonant. It also had really clear and lyrical and memorable melodies and had a solid beat with a strong dance groove. So you could dance, you know, Lindy Hop or East Coast Swing. And of course, it swung. The rhythm section of a big band is really the thing that holds the entire song or the entire genre really together and provides a nice, tight, structured part so that the horns can play a little bit freer and looser um, and be a little bit more adventurous with the time. But the rhythm section had to be really on point and really strict. And, as I mentioned before, swing music was almost entirely commercial and part of the mass entertainment industry. It was all about showmanship, which is epitomized by people like Cab Calloway and Fats Waller. Now, there were also two different styles of swing music. There was Sweet Swing, which was played by people like Glenn Miller, which used less improvisation, was generally a bit slower, a bit more restrained, with only a slight swing feel, and was really for the white upper-class dinner parties. And then there was Hot Swing, which was played by people like Duke Ellington. Now, this was more daring, more experimental, a bit faster, had longer improvisations, a strong rhythmic drive, and a very rough, bluesy feeling. Another interesting and important development happened with swing era improvisation. Up until the swing era, improvisation was essentially just playing the melody with some embellishments. The embellishments gradually became more adventurous, but they were always played with the melody in mind. Then during the swing era, the sax player Coleman Hawkins changed the way jazz approached improvisation, from melody to harmony. Instead of just embellishing the existing melody, he created a whole new melody based on the chord's harmony by arpeggiating the chords and also adding some further chord alterations and substitutions to make the solo a bit more complex. 
And as I said before, this approach was then further expanded upon by Bebop, which largely abandoned the original melody of a song to create brand new melodies based on that established chord progression, which is known as a contrafact. Now, in the early years of jazz, up until and including the swing era, the piano was very much rooted in the rhythm section of the band. So generally, a pianist played very rhythmically. For this reason, the pianist's left hand generally played chords on the beat, while the right hand built rhythmic patterns around chords and chord tones, and especially the guide tones, often by just playing arpeggios or simple bluesy licks. So some of the piano techniques employed during the swing era were stride piano, which was really important in swing, and that's essentially just playing uh, bass chord bass chord, so the, a bass note on beats 1 and 3 and a chord on beats 2 and 4. Using the interval of a tenth and a tenth triad, so building up a triad by going 1, 5, 3. Using walking bass lines and walking tenths. So those were the main or the big three that were used in uh, swing music, but they also used things like the three-handed effect, strumming, which was a technique that was widely used by pianist Errol Garner, the rolling bass technique, broken tenths, or boogie-woogie style um, ostinatos. And as I said before, the right hand played rhythmic chord-based patterns, embellished arpeggios, the embellished melody, or some simple riffs. So, for example, the song Kansas City Keys by Count Basie is a classic example of jazz swing piano. Right, so that used a combination of walking bass lines, tenth triads, and stride piano. With a nice simple bluesy melody, which largely just outlined the chord progression or played nice bluesy licks using the blues scale. Now, as the name suggests, Count Basie played in Kansas City. And they played a particular type of swing in Kansas City that became known as Kansas City Jazz. Not the most creative name, but there you go. So Kansas City Jazz is characterized by extended soloing, a really heavy swing rhythm, a really bluesy feel, and often using a 12 bar blues structure, and songs that were based and structured around riffs. So riffs could be the focal point um, of a song at a particular moment, riffs could be played behind the soloist, or multiple riffs could be playing at the same time, creating a kind of call and response. And because the songs were heavily riff based, they were often played from memory by the band rather than from sheet music. And this is where the term head comes from, meaning the original melody of a particular song. That is, it's all in your head, not written down on paper. This also contributed to the loose and spontaneous feel of Kansas City Jazz. And in fact, Kansas City Jazz marked the transition between the heavily structured and composed and arranged and written out big band style of swing music to the more fluid and improvisational style of bebop. So I've listed a few well-known swing band band leaders, pianists, and just musicians in general up here in the picture-in-picture, picture, so go have a listen to them. But I'm sure you've already heard of most of them, and in fact probably heard many of their songs, because they're just that famous. Cool, and that's it for me. Thanks a lot, guys, and see you next time. Bye.